I am Renato Flores, the very proud publisher of all the scholarly and entertaining books on Rudolf Valentino by Evelyn Zumaya, Michael Morris, and uh, Aurelio Micoli. I am here today with Evelyn to discuss more about her research discoveries on Rudolf Valentino in general. So, Evelyn. Ciao, Renato. In this episode, I want to talk about Rudolf Valentino's involvement in the occult. Rudolf Valentino and his second wife, Natasha Rambova, both participated in spiritualist activities, seances, automatic writing, and both of them heeded the astral advice of Rudolf's two spirit guides, an American Indian named Blackfeather and an ancient Egyptian named Mesalope. Can you explain what you mean by astral? Guides, spirit guides, and automatic writing. Yes, spirit guides are deceased people who exist on the astral plane. The astral plane is to some people a concept of the afterlife, and to others it is a physical place existing, I guess, in some parallel dimension. I am not going to expound upon the many versions of definition of the astral plane, and for today's discussion I will just say it is the soul's most immediate destination after death. So following this theory, spirit guides, such as Rudy Valentino's Black Feather and Mesalope, exist on the astral plane, and from there they communicate with psychically sensitive people on earth. These guides allegedly communicate through direct psychic transmission, automatic writing, or through the use of a medium in a seance setting or psychic person who falls into a trance and then permits these guides to speak to the living through them. You know, this communication with the dead was not such an unusual belief in the 1920s, Renato, and Rudy Valentino and Natasha Rambova were not unusual in participating in this type of activity. The concept of communication from spirit guides was remarkably respected, too, at the time, as it was also proposed by the founder of the very popular theosophical movement, Helena Blavatsky. Theosophy was, and, and is, a general study of world religions and beliefs. Blavatsky founded her theosophical societies based upon a synthesis of all religious thought, including spiritualism and the occult. She alleged she wrote her manifesto, The Secret Doctrine, because it was all psychically spoken to her by her personal spirit guides, or Mahatmas, meaning great masters. It did not seem as bizarre as it might to some today that Rudy would have discovered two spirit guides, and for a while he took the advice of these two quite seriously. I know that Rudy and Natasha took the advice of these two guides, but maybe Rudy more than Natasha. Well, Natasha never claimed to have her own spirit guides, and Blackfeather and Mesalope were known to be Rudy's alone. According to Natasha, he was able to go into a trance and write automatically, and this was his method of transcribing long messages from both of his spirit guides and, on a few occasions, from his deceased mother. Success with automatic writing, uh, as I have learned, depends upon one's ability to empty the mind of any distraction and not direct the writing. This means that the writing is being done with as much unawareness of the writer as possible. This was something that apparently Rudy was quite adept at doing, at least for a while. You called this occult activity before. Why is that? I said occult because it really is by definition, and I quote, involving or relating to supernatural, mystical, or magical powers or phenomena, end quote. Rudy and Natasha also participated in seances. Rudy's manager and closest friend George Ullman and his wife attended some seances with Rudy and Natasha. At the time, seances were a trendy after-dinner activity. A seance would involve a medium who delivered messages from spirit guides and would not necessarily mean Rudy was automatically writing. So his two Mahatmas, or spirit guides, held different roles in dispensing direction to Rudy. Blackfeather was more of a daily life coach, I guess you might call him today. He would advise on whether Rudy should accept a role in a movie, even how to transact his daily business. Well, Mesalope was a teacher of arcane knowledge, sharing esoteric wisdom about the loftier aspects of life and generalities. How do you think Rudolf and Natasha got interested in this? Honestly, Renato, I think they were inspired in this occult direction by the trends enjoyed by their own generation. This was all very popular, as I said. Novels by Talbot Munday, R.T.M. Scott, 
uh, which all included occult and theosophical themes, were bestsellers, and radio shows capitalized on the trend with weekly shows about the supernatural. Natasha certainly encouraged Rudy in this direction. She and her mother were deeply affiliated with the Point Loma Theosophical Society that was in San Diego, and the study of the astral plane and the wisdom religions, as they referred to them, were a dominant theme in both these women's lives then and would be for several years to come. Uh, occult activity was a common element then, from tarot readers to crystal ball fortune tellers and the fad popularity of Ouija boards. Uh, people were just captivated by the occult. The author of the Sherlock Holmes detective series, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, encouraged the movement, and many celebrities contributed to the craze for the occult. Actresses such as Doris Kenyon and, and the widow of the Italian tenor Enrico Caruso all spoke openly about their participation in seances. After Rudy and Natasha divorced, did he continue to do his automatic writing? According to George Ullman, he did not. It appears he let it go when Natasha left. Natasha would certainly continue with her occult interest, and she delved even further into these activities. Do you think people today are skeptical about this or interest in this seriously? Uh, I think there's a great deal of both cynicism and belief, and this is most apparent when the subject of Rudy's Book of Poetry Daydreams is discussed. Uh, there have been decades, this has been a decades-long debate over whether Rudy wrote the poems, whether someone else did, uh, or whether he actually psychically transcribed them from deceased poets. I think Rudy was perfectly capable of writing the poems intellectually, but did he? Uh, I guess it remains a mystery, and one that Valentino aficionados just like to ponder. So, what do you think? Did Rudy write them or not? Well, I recently read uh, an old book by William Pelly titled The Dead or Alive. He became interested in seances at that time after he had an out-of-body experience. Uh, anyway, Pelly writes extensively how deceased authors utilize living authors to continue writing. I found that kind of wild to believe, but who knows. Uh, I just have to add here, though, uh, that as interesting as his premise was, Pelly was a horrible person and a... Nazi sympathizer and a fascist, and he would go to prison in 1942 for acts of sedition against the U.S. government. Uh, and I cite William Pelly only because I want to point out that Rudy and Natasha were not the only people to purport this concept of authors or poets transmitting their work from the astral plane. I think this discussion makes the Daydreams poems all the more intriguing myself. What did George Ullman have to say about this? Well, Renato, he made a point of saying Rudy had a spiritual quality, and he felt that this was not so widely acknowledged in general. I think George meant this quality was more mystical than religious. I think this aspect of Rudy's story has truly inspired spiritualistic interest in him, and does t until today. There are countless stories of how he haunts places he once frequented. But I think this is more of a wishful thinking for some people hoping for a vision of Rudy to manifest. I will resist a temptation to be cynical and say, who knows, Renato, but perhaps Rudy's ghost does haunt. But after his death, many seances were held with the participants, or sitters, as they're called, trying to communicate with him. One was even held at his last home, Falcon Lair. George Ullman wrote how he and his wife were often invited to seances after Rudy's death because people felt if he was there, Rudy just might manifest. Uh, he wrote about Rudy's occult interest and the seance in his 1975 memoir, and I'm going to read an excerpt about that, which starts on page 97, and I quote, Valentino and his wife were seriously interested in occultism and any form of spiritualism that came to their attention. I have already remarked upon the influence of Miss Cora Medici, whose letters, she said, were written while she was in a trance and conveyed messages purportedly from souls old and new in the beyond. The Valentinos, and my wife and I, frequently attended seances in New York at the residence of Victor Miller, an antique dealer who sold Rudy very many antique pieces of armor and jewelry at high prices. There, Mr. Miller assembled a number of other psychics and spiritualists, and as a group, they called upon spirits to manifest themselves. Frequently, one or more of these believers, 
urgently and loudly claimed that they had seen a spirit known to them. I cannot dispute this, but neither Rudy, Natasha, my wife, nor I ever saw or heard anything beyond the heavy breathing of the assembled guests. We frequently attended gatherings of endowed persons, but except for the automatic writings by Miss McGeechee, we were not fortunate enough to see or hear any persons from beyond the grave. After Rudy died, and while administering his estate, I made valiant efforts to sell Rudy's last unhappy home. I had to engage a caretaker to keep the curious and vandals away. On one occasion early one morning, a tenant phoned me at my home to tell me that he hadn't been able to sleep since he came there because of various ethereal sounds in the house. He pleaded with me to come up at once and hear these sounds for myself. I drove to Falcon Lair that rather windy, cold night, and soon he called my attention to sounds one could imagine were groans and other sounds somewhat like the soft music of a harp. I cannot say why, but I had no fear or apprehension, and slowly prowled around the house until I located where the sounds originated. They were caused by some loose wiring near the partly open door leading to the tunnel, which connected the main house to the servants' quarters. So the caretaker remained in the house, Later, however, he became a believer in spiritual communication and persuaded my wife and I to attend another seance in Hollywood where the talented medium told him Rudy was certain to appear, but only if I was present. We attended a seance there one night. There were about 20 people present, and the manifestation began in a dimly lighted room. The voices came from behind a curtain, and a wraith-like figure in white gauze appeared for a moment breathing the name of one of the persons present. Some of these people believed entirely because they wanted to believe, and several times one would cry out for forgiveness or blessings or enlightenment. I noticed that all of the wraiths were about the same height and build and that the voice was always alike. The great moment arrived when the voice said, I am here, George, I am Rudy, and the same figure stepped out from behind the curtain, this time dressed in a version of a sheik. It was quite difficult to withstand the impulse to approach the figure, but it disappeared behind the curtain in a few seconds. Later I spoke to the medium and complimented her upon her histrionic ability and gave her a $5 bill. End quote. This story shows uh, George Ullman's devotion to the management of Rudolf Valentino affairs after his death. It sure does, Renato. It's really true. And in light of all of the evidence existing of George Ullman's efforts and his years of work closing out Rudy's business affairs, it is still mind-blowing to me that there are some, those notable few, who believe there is any historical validity and cruelly continue to defame and impugn his memory with trivial, snide, and irrelevant self-serving insults. During his life, those who witnessed the friendship and business relationship of George Allman and Rudolph Valentino had nothing but glowing praise for Allman. Uh, their common friend, the New York Day-by-Day -Day columnist O.O. O. McIntyre wrote, and I'll give this quote here, Valentino loved the author of this book, George Allman, in the manner of a devoted brother. He did nothing of importance without discussing it with George, and no one was so grievously stricken by his passing as Allman. It was a heart wrench that will be with him always. Now, in previous episodes, Renato, we have discussed why these few particular people continue to cast a false light on George Allman. But it needs to be rejected by thinking and discriminating folks because the evidence supports Allman's integrity. And also in light of what happened to him subsequently as a result of his acting as Rudy's executor, I think these certain people need to look at the larger picture of what happened to this man's life as a result of his devotion to Rudy and stop the nonsensical hating of him. He was exonerated by the Court of Appeals and the judge praised his efforts as Rudy's executor. That is fact. It is also fact that in the immediate years after the stock market crash of 1929, when Ullman voluntarily resigned as a state executor, he turned over an estate showing an enormous profit. This when he assumed a heavily indebted estate when Rudy died. So how can this ever be interpreted into mismanagement? The efforts to impugn Omen are just an archaic and false parroting of misinformation. If George was witness to these seances and lights as Falcon Lair, 
Was he a believer in this? Um, I would say he definitely was not. This said he was not demeaning about those who did believe, and he was respectful. But there is no evidence that he or his wife were active seance attendees later in their life. I think Rudolph Valentino left a legacy of mystery in the minds and hearts of his fans when he died. And this has been nurtured by some who are believers in the occult. And this is understandable, I guess, really. Uh, it's a way to have him still among the living and not relegated just to a coffin in a cold crypt in Hollywood. If someone can believe they can contact him psychically, then he is mobile and still moving about. Uh, I guess in the ethers you could say he still would be an active soul. Is Rudolf Valentino's crypt a site for occult activity now? Oh, Renato, who knows? I, I would imagine they have security cameras there and have witnessed a lot. There are decades of wild stories from that crypt. But no, I would say that's not the case now. I would say the opposite is true, and if anything, there's an overt religious overtone to the crypt today. During the annual memorial service there, hosted by Tracy Terhune, uh, the man who, by the way, also runs the hate blog against me and my work, uh, he reads from the Bible during the service before Rudy's remains, so I cannot say this would be considered spiritualism or a cult activity. I do find it an odd tribute to a man who was not religious, uh, who did not practice any religion, and whose experience with spirituality was to channel souls from the astral plane. Uh, I think it would be wrong to give the impression that Rudy was a member of some cult, because as we know, a cult is, and I quote a definition as, uh, an instance of great veneration of a person, ideal, or thing, especially as manifested by a body of admirers. Anyways, Rudy's form of occultism was not the venerating as a part of a group of people or as a leader of that group of people, but as an individual, uh, more esoteric in practice. And it seemed to be a phase in his life as he was not so openly involved in this after his divorce from Natasha. I know you are working on a follow-up uh, to this discussion and your project. And I'm very excited for you to finish that work. For today, Evelyn, I know you have something else you want to address. Yes, I do, Renato. It does not merit addressing those professional haters uh, who have worked so hard to prevent people from reading Affairs Valentino or knowing the truth about Rudolf Valentino's life story. It does not merit responding to their every hateful and endlessly repetitive word they write. Uh, I just want to say here today to them, to take those disgusting bully blogs down, especially the blog run by Tracy Terhune. Yes, he is the MC of the Hollywood Forever Valentino Memorial Service, which I just spoke about. Uh, I ask him personally, again, as I have many times, to take that hate blog offline. This blog, which he has run for six years under my book's title to defame me and harass me, and where he now provides an eager platform, for David Brett and Dark Mum to post some of the most hateful and utterly false things about me, my work, and especially about you, Renato. These are disgusting insults, hateful things, all hosted by Tracy Terhune. You know, no matter what they have spewed on Tracy Terhune's Hate Us blog and the other blogs they run against us, it is now no longer about their crappy content but about their obvious motive, which oozes from their every word. Hate is their motive. They are haters. So close the blogs, and Tracy Terhune return that blog under my book's title, which, as I have said before, was mine until David Brett extorted me into closing it. Return that rightful URL to me. I also want to tell listeners to recognize these haters' signatures their lies, abusive posts, and their words, which still litter the Internet. Recognize them, and know this is not the truth. It is not my truth, nor the truth about my work, or of you, Renato. It is not the truth, nor do they have taken some days off in their posting. And uh, let me guess. I'm sure, because of this podcast, they will come back with more answers for us, right away. I hope listeners will defy them 
and read for themselves Affairs Valentino and all of the other excellent books you have so courageously published, Renato. The important S. George Ullman memoir, his 1975 memoir, and the wonderful book by Aurelio Mickley, The Infancy of the Myth, and the book I co-authored with our great friend Michael Morris, his posthumous book, Beyond Valentino. These books, all available online on Amazon, deserve all the respect possible from the legitimate Valentino community. But unfortunately, as we have discussed in previous podcast episodes, these fine books are being boycotted by the haters. No matter what very lame excuse they might present for doing this, they have openly allied in this effort, and this needs to be remedied. So... For today, Evelyn, I think we have covered quite a lot, and we thank our listeners and say stay tuned. And, as always, Fiat Justitia Ruat Celum, and Arrivederci. 